ask questions and participate, ask questions of him. And uh, so the evening will, will actually be a more participatory event for all of you. Um, I'd like to uh, particularly express uh, my gratitude for uh, Susan, who um, met Ashok at an event here on Lopez. I don't know if many of you know that he is indeed connected to this island. It's funny, I've traveled all over the world and everywhere I go I meet somebody who knows or something of Lopez or is connected to Lopez. We seem to be quite a vortex of energy here. And we're going to recognize that tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ashok Gangati. Thank you, Shabra, for that lovely introduction. And uh, as you pointed out correctly, that Susan O'Neill and I were talking uh, last summer uh, when it was Tasha's graduation. And uh, she was talking about the energy on the island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was talking about the energy. How's that? Yeah. The energy on the island. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, how appropriate it would be to have an occasion like this. So the seed was planted. And, but I do feel I, I belong. Uh, or I wish to be belong in Lopez with family here, Bob and Sue and Tasha and Ariel as family, and uh, now meeting uh, Jean Barb and Ria, uh, with ancient friends overnight. <laughs> I feel I belong. But I, when my first visit here, I was very impressed with <clears throat> what I discovered was the uh, Lopez salute, and everywhere I went. <clears throat> and so, of course, I wanted to belong, and I consciously tried to do it to pass. But I was very deliberate, and I was more like a mainland geek. <laughs> and in the second visit, I tried to be more casual, and I realized that everyone was very casual about it. So I tried to look the other way and obliquely just give a flash. <laughs> I felt better. I was beginning to pass, but this time I think I've got it down because I just hit one finger, or one left hand, right hand, raise my eyebrow, whatever. It all works. So now I feel I belong here. That's a long dream of mine. So. Anyway, this, uh, for what I gathered for, uh, about, uh, and Susan Wilson four years ago was encouraging me to, to uh, come and get to know this place better in terms of meeting the community because in the work I'm doing around the planet, working with world leaders and all of my career for the last 40 years as a philosopher, uh, really attempting to invent a new frontier of philosophy that I call global philosophy. There's never been a space and a language and, a, and the narrative and the mythology of a global philosophy. We have philosophies that are all in different cultures across the planet, and everyone is a philosopher. You have a worldview. So it's really, philosophia means love of wisdom. Philosophia, Sophia from the Greek is the, the woman, and, love, and she embodies truth and wisdom, and my profession is to love her. Philosophia, which is a great profession to be in. But we're all philosophers, naturally, and it's not just professionalized, you know. And, um, in, in the European tradition, Socrates is considered a hero of philosophy because he was a, a citizen, a Lopezian, and he went around making trouble by asking questions because he felt people thought they knew but they didn't know. And he was asking radical questions and he got hemlock for it. And uh, I don't know if you have any hemlock on Lopez here. <laughs> so I'll be careful. <laughs> but, you know, that's the spirit of philosophy, ask the radical questions to know thyself. And that's been one of the models of, um, of the quest for wisdom. And so what I'd like to talk about is that I feel around the planet that we're in a profound moment in human history. The human being is being born. Even though we've been here for millennia, eons, we, something profound has been happening in our coming into our full form as global beings. And I want to talk about that because we're all raised in cultures, we know that. But what we don't usually realize is that from day one, or before day one, in utero, we're already being shaped in the lens of our mind and our culture. And most of us don't realize that we have a lens of a mind, if, so that if you're raised in a Christian worldview, that is a certain lens and mindscape in terms of which we interpret ourselves and others and everything around us. Our world is made through how we use our minds. And we all have lenses. And so if I'm raised in the Hindu world, it's a profoundly different lens than it is if you're in the Judeo-Christian world. And if you could cross worlds and go into the Hindu mind 
and enter that ecology of mind and understand, you know, that what is prana, what is samsara, what is karma, what is dharma, you know, what is all, all of these terms, if you don't have them, you can't just uh, translate them into a Judeo-Christian vocabulary and think you have it. Even though we have yoga in America, and it's, it's, it's come to the West, and we're, 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 many of us we practice yoga, we may not be getting the, the yoga as it truly is meant to be understood in the Hindu world. Or to go into the Buddhist mind, or to enter the world of Tao, or the Confucian world in the Chinese tradition, and all of the many different indigenous wisdom traditions we have across the planet in Africa, and in Native American wisdom, for example, Lakota and Hopi and so forth. They're all different lenses. And we humans don't even realize often that we have a lens. We simply see the world, it presents to us what we see on the screen of our awareness. We don't realize we have a lens, and if we can go into a different cultural world, or a different religion, or a different ideology, or a different discipline, you have to morph your lens to see the world differently. And we're not educated in that. So we naively think that what appears to the screen of our mind is reality. We take it at face value. And yet the deepest first stage of being an awakened critical thinker and we value reason and education and critical thinking, is to step back and realize, oh my God, I have a lens. In fact, many of us have multiple lens. I'll talk about that in a moment. And we don't even realize it. And what makes sense in one world often doesn't make sense. You can't even think it or express it or experience it in a very different world. So if you're raised in the Judeo-Christian world, you can, perhaps can't see what it means to be reincarnation and transmigration and samsara and the eternal cycle of time, repeating, and why being an existing human being can keep you entrapped in a certain cycle, and so forth. And yet, the failure to understand how to, that we have a world, that we have lenses, and to develop the competency and literacy as a human being to cross worlds and do it consciously, we're really illiterate and incompetent. We don't know how to cross worlds. And that really showed up to me very early in my training as a philosopher. I was trained in the European tradition, Western tradition. I'm trained as a logician. I'll talk about that in a moment. Logic is a very high science. It's really a science of a, a profound level of the structure of consciousness and the laws of thought. And no matter what you're thinking about, if you're thinking in mathematics, in economics, in politics, in human relations, in your love life, uh, on the athletic field, wherever you are thinking, you are using the laws of dynamics of thought. So that logic is a profound science. If you can understand the structure of thinking, then you can understand, you can get the code, the DNA, of what's going on in your world and your experience. So that was my training in logic. But what I encountered in my early career as a, in Western philosophy, and studying the philosophy from the early Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and all the great Greek thinkers, all the way through to modern thinking past Hegel and Kant, going through Descartes, Locke, Barclay, Hume, all the way through the modern period, and into it today. And looking at the great revolutions in logic, I found a profound split at the heart of logic. And it was, dismay it was a, uh, dismaying for me, because logic is supposed to be giving you the science of human reason. And if reason is split, then we're in trouble because anything goes. You can say what you want, I can say what I want, and you can end up in sophistry. Which is why Socrates uh, you know, took on uh, the, the, the people who alleged to teach wisdom around him and got into trouble for it. So in a, in a real way, you know, everything is at stake in terms of understanding the coherence of reason. And what I found is that if you, on that theme of being in your worldview, I was never trained as a thinker, as a philosopher, to step into different worlds and consciously morph the ecology of my mind to see the world differently, so that I can understand the Hindu worldview and the Buddhist and the Chinese and African worldviews and so forth. But in my journey, uh, after being trained and getting my doctorate at Brandeis University, I'm going to put some, I'm an incurable recovering logician, so I'm going to be putting up some visualizations here to make, to make it uh, accelerate the process. Uh, and uh, in my training, I began to see, when I went to India for the first time in 1971, after I discovered the split in reason, saturated in the, in the uh, European uh, Anglo-American uh, tradition of philosophy, I went to India for the first time. My, my ancestors are from India. I was born in Trinidad, grew up in Jamaica, came here as a boy to New York, and was educated in the East Coast 
in New York City and, and so forth. So when I went to India for the first time, I thought I, 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 I was going to study the music and the, the tabla and just saturate myself in what I thought was my home roots. Uh, I didn't realize it would speak to the condition of the split I found. But the moment I started to read the Bhagavad Gita, I was at the University of Pune. I was both lecturing as a, uh, as a visiting professor on logic and the split in logic, but starting to study for the first time Sanskrit and Hindu and Buddhist philosophy. And the moment I began to study the Hindu philosophy, it blew me away completely. Because I realized, if you've read the Bhagavad Gita, or, or the Buddhist text, the Dhammapada, the first thing these teachers saw in the tradition is if you're egoing, if you're stuck in the ego lens, in the ego mind, you're going to suffer. And the main point about awakening as a human being is to realize you're egoing, that there's a whole way of structure of thinking in the ego space. It will always split on you. It'll split you from truth. It'll split yourself. It'll split you from one another and would ultimately lead to suffering and violence. And that was the essence of Buddha's awakening. That was the essence of the dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. And I was struck by that. It opened a new door because I said, why was I not educated in what was called ego thinking? So as I began to open up this new doorway, I began to then go across worlds because I, the main question I wanted to answer in my life was how do we humans cross our worlds? How do we go, can we genuinely be raised in a certain culture and yet step into the world of the other. And I really believe we can. I was raised between worlds uh, with a Hindu family life and background and so forth. My father taught yoga in New York, one of the first teachers. And at the same time going to Christian schools and being raised in that bicultural situation. So what I began to see, and this is one of the visualizations, is that if you could step back from one world, from one tradition, and begin to open up what I call the global lens, the global mind, and try to hold multiple worlds in, in view in, in one moment in your, in your integral consciousness, you begin to see astounding patterns that you can't really see as readily if you're just in one lens or one worldview. And so although the space, and I hope you can see, I don't know if you can see this, should you move it back? So can you all see this all right? Yeah, I'd like you to. Or you could move, move up closer to there. But, uh, <clears throat> so the space I was talking about before, the, the logicians write it. I'm going to put a kind of a space just to frame it. I hope this has some ink in it. This seems to be drying up. I may have to switch. I tried to get a thicker marker so you can see in the back. I hope you can see. Uh, but, but the space here is a space in which we all seem to live and are educated. And we don't even realize the I, that I am, that has that, when I speak of the lens, the lens that I have, and the screen of awareness that it all shows up. And this is just a space in which you are conscious. And so right now when you see you're in a room and there are other people and the sun is shining and the grass is green and everything is happening, this is also, if you're talking about your internal feelings, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm uh, comfortable, I'm comfortable, this is all showing up on the space of awareness. Right? And logicians and philosophers have been obsessed with what's going on in this space. All of logic was really born here for Aristotle, the founder of the science of logic, says that to think is to predicate. To predicate is a fun, a, you know, technical word, but simply it means to join pieces of information to form thoughts and experiences. So if I look at the pen and I say the pen is for writing, the predicates are the, in, the, the, the qualities that belong to the object. So here is the obje object, and here are the attributes and the qualities that belong. So when you put them together, you begin to build your world of information structure here. And if you can understand the DNA structure and the laws of logic, and Aristotle thought he broke through with that, and Socrates was trying to get it, Plato was going for it, right? But Aristotle finally got the laws of thought that a subject must be either P or not P. It can't be both P and not P. The pen is either black or not black. It can't be both black or not black. So that the whole structure of information is played out in this space. And, and most of us live our lives and are educated and, and experience in that space. And when I spoke about the different lenses, if you can switch the lenses across cultures, you'll get very different stories. If you put on the Hindu lens, you'll get a Hindu story. If you put on the, the Judaic lens, the Christian lens, and when you shift lens, it's a profound shift that people live and die for and kill for. 
across worlds. There's profound abysmal, abysmal violence in the collision of worldviews. And you may have heard of Huntington, for example, who talked about the 21st century being the time of the clash of civilizations as a real threat to the sustainability of humanity. That in the 9-11s and the, the abysmal violence that happens across borders, you know, the holocausts and the ethnic cleansings and the way we mutilate each other, it has to do with the lenses we use and the different pictures and stories we have. <clears throat> so that a Christian will have one story here, a Muslim will have a different one. Is it Allah? Or is it Christ? Is it Yahweh? Or is it Buddha? Is it Brahman? Is it Tao? And so forth. So in this space, it's a compressed space in which it seems to be one or the other. Each claims to be universal truth. If it's Allah and Allah is the only name, then the others have to go. And yet, all of these great teachers were saying, don't get stuck, get stuck in the box. So that the Tao, so I, what I'm doing right now is opening up the space here, which is one technology of consciousness, the place, the global space, and to contrast it with a certain way of trying to get a take on what's in the box, where most of us get stuck and live, and apparently it's unsustainable, and it's deadly. And yet, so the, what I'm suggesting is the journey out of this ego lens and ego space and in the box, let's say in the box, into this open, profound space of connectivity is what all of the great teachers are seeing one way or the other. And it's no coincidence that across the planet, the greatest seers of wisdom have said there is something profoundly unifying at first that's the ground of ultimate reality. So in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu said the Tao, the name of this, that is named is not the Tao. It's the opening line. It's a warning label, don't place the infinite force, name, reality in the box. Don't use these labels and names to name what is fundamentally real and the ultimate source. <clears throat> and so in the Om tradition, the whole win hin Hindu wisdom is Om. Focus on Om. And if you could focus on Om, the infinite syllable, the infinite force, again, it's a symbol, it's a, it's a word, it has a word power, mind power. It's an ultimate unifying force, it's infinite. And again, so if you try to put Om in the box, everything falls apart and breaks down. And the whole point in the Bhagavad Gita, if you've read the Bhagavad Gita, which is a basic text of Hindu teaching, it begins, it's a very, uh, very moving dialogue between Arjuna, who's a war, it opens up, it's a battle of a family. And half of the family is on the battlefield. And the banners are waving, and the conch shells are sounding, and it was a time to charge. And Arjuna and his brothers are on one side and fighting for the right to rule the kingdom. And the other side, his cousins, and, his, and he sees his teachers, and his uncles, and his relatives, and the other side of the field. And Krishna is his charioteer. And Krishna is the incarnation of Om, the infinite force, who happens to be his charioteer, symbolic gesture, the high consciousness embodied, the high self. So he sees his family across the way, and he's as a, trained as a warrior and a, and, a, and a martial artist to kill. That's his ethic. And he sees his family, looks in their eyes, he sees his uncle, and even his cousins, and says, this I can't do. I can't kill my own people. Something is wrong. Conscience started to break through. And when this starts to open up, that's the beginning of philosophy. That's the he broke down on the battlefield. He split on the battlefield. He says, what is right? It can't be right to kill my own people. And yet, Krishna, if I drop my weapon on the battlefield and my reputation is over, it's suicide for me. But if I kill my relatives, I can't live with myself. So he was in a lost, lose-lose situation. He so said, Krishna, help me. So at that point, when the, you reach the sense that something isn't working in the space, then you start to question that space. This is, my life isn't working. That's called the midlife crisis. <laughs> right? When your identity structure breaks out, your world cracks. People hit it at different times. It just falls apart. And at that point, a deeper inquiry begins. So, uh, that's why the Gita is a great text, and I recommend it highly. Uh, and it's, it presents the, the, the Hindu wisdom. And so Krishna, this voice, begins to counsel when Ar Arjuna says, Krishna, help me. Arjuna is the ego person. Here's the ego mind. See, the ego self doesn't understand 
that by treating itself as a separately existing reality, me, I, something profound happens that seems to break the circuits with being connected with everything around you. And these thinkers, I'm just on my way quickly fast forward to give you a sense of 3,000 years of evolution of wisdom across the planet, where all of these great teachers were saying, if you get stuck here, you're finished. And the whole point about the human journey, and individually and collectively, is to cross into this space and realize who you are and your interconnectivity with each other, with yourself, to become an integral whole self, and with the ecology and with all reality. And the reason is that whatever name you use for the fundamental, and that's what's been named so differently, so that Buddha is teaching too. Buddha's awakening is exactly paralleling what Krishna was teaching Arjuna. Krishna showed Arjuna, Arjuna, and it was really almost comical, the, the, the tragedy of the breakdown of the battlefield, and yet Krishna is in this jovial mood with, with Arjuna in this crisis moment, because Krishna understood that he has to help Arjuna understand that the war that he's in and his breakdown of his life has to do with the technology of the mind that he's using by egoing and being in this box. Because when you're here, look what happens. You make yourself one of these things, like everything else. What is the pen? The pen is for writing, the pen is black, the pen is, you know, is this and that, and it's disposable. Uh, I am a man, I'm an American, I'm a father, I'm, uh, you know, I'm from Lopez Island. Whatever it is, you give your information structure and you manufacture yourself as a, a subject of predication. You become impredicated. That's what it means to be a being, an entity. We entify ourselves. We make ourselves into things. Even though I'm a subject who's thinking, I process myself in this space and we process each other in this space. And if I have my lens and I'm raised in, say, a Judeo-Christian culture, and I'm interpreting you out there from a Muslim culture or a Buddhist culture. I take you through my lens. I don't even realize I'm violating you by processing you in my way, in my language, in my culture, through the space. So Krishna understood that he had to help Arjuna wake up and see that he is separating himself off, making himself an object. That's what led to his split, because in this technology it always polarizes and splits. We could talk about that later. I don't want to go on too much with that. I just want to give us a sense of this consensus of wisdom that there's something about egoing that leads to alienation, fragmentation, polarization, dual duality, incommensurable. There are all kinds of names for it, but it means things don't hold together. I don't hold together, I'm broken. Our relationships don't work. We're split from each other. Across the borders of our world, violence breaks out and lack of communication and dialogue. And it leads to all kinds of fallouts of human pathologies personal pathologies in my own inner life, and interpersonal, intercultural pathologies that as a culture can be ill if it's really using and dominated by what might be called ego-mental thinking in using this technology. So all of these great teachers have been teaching become aware of this, understand the dangers, become competent in understanding what com comes from this, and that there's an alternative and you have a choice. And that's basically Buddha's teaching. Buddha's awakening and you know the story of Buddha. He was raised as a Hindu prince, but he, he, he uh, went through all of the teachings uh, in the early, and he, you can get all the great teachings here, and they still don't work. That's really the trouble. If you're educated to think, and you take all of this wisdom and puts it here, you're gutting it. And Buddha saw that what he was getting educated was not answering the question of human suffering. And so when he had this great illumination of awakening, he saw, we've got to get out of this trap, of this box, this habit, this obsession. It's an addiction. We're all ego addicts. It's an addiction. So his four noble truths, which are great truths for all the planet, they're global truths. He reduced all of his enlightenment to four simple axioms. Existence here is, a, is suffering. I mean, you're going to be, you're going to, you, you cannot be fulfilled. Existential suffering, you mean. You can have all the wealth, but you're still suffering. It has a cause. The cause is egoing. And when you ego, you're making a choice. You have a choice between not egoing and being a connected self or a disconnected. So the source of the suffering is the ego. It can be overcome. You have a choice. That's the third thing. And how do you overcome it? By rehabilitating the patterns of thinking in the Eightfold Path of Rehab. It's rehab work. It's therapy. 
right practice, right intention, right understanding, right interpretation, right living. I mean, you practice that in every moment. You begin to break out of the ego addiction habit and you become an interconnected being and you enter the space of shunyata, which is the name for this. What is that? Shunyata in the Sanskrit means zero. Shunya is zero. And zero-ness means nothing here. None of these marks or names and things that we have here can touch and enter into the empty, infinite, boundless space of interconnectivity. Again, that theme comes up. When you get out of the box, you enter into a deep, boundless field of interconnectivity. So Buddha's insight is that we are not objects. We are events and dynamic energy fields of interconnection. So that when I experience myself in this interconnected way, I am one with the ecology, I'm one with the trees, one with each other. And I literally experience myself in you. And that's compassion. So you become a human being when you can experience the compassion of connectivity with the other. And you realize there's a common source holding us together in our vast diversity. So there's a profound science here. And the technology. How do we use our minds in a competent way that we can handle an amazing disclosure that we are connected to the infinite force? We can't handle that. That's a, that's a life-threatening thought, that there could be some infinite, boundless aspect of myself that I want to be here and have control and egoize myself and make everything finite and comfortable. But in fact, these teachers are saying, that ain't you. You are not an object. You are an energy field, a vast interconnectivity with the web of the universe. So in the Buddha's language, Indra's net, right? Indra's net is an infinite, they were already great scientists. They're envisioning what's now being called the unified field. Indra's net is an infinite field with vast, infinite, boundless diversity with boundless nodes connecting each as a jewel that reflects the entire field within itself and is itself a center of the entire field. That's Indra's net. That means each person here is a sacred node in the net of reality, a unique miracle reflecting the entire universe uniquely. So there's diversity. And yet, in the diversity, there's deep connectivity because every point is connected. And there's no point that's an atomically <coughs> separable point. There's only interconnectivity. And so what is the technology that enables us to experience that in ourselves and in each other and in our relations? Well, that's ethics, that's awakening mind, that's rationality. That's what the art of being a human being, that's all Buddhist thought. So that there are clear pathways of learning how to enter into the field of shunyata and experience the compassion of the Dharma. Then you're in the Dharma. The Dharma is a law, the moral law, the law of nature. There's no split between nature and ethics. When you are naturing and following your nature of interconnectivity, you see yourself in the other. You give the Lopez salute, you do the namaste, and you experience that deep connectivity. And all of the teachers are teaching that. And in the Judaic tradition, it's the same point. Yahweh, the infinite spirit, so the Judaic breakthrough was to see the infinite God must be one because the infinite can only be one. It's a simple arithmetic. Think about it. You can't have two infinites. It's a contradiction. Because one infinite would limit the other and it wouldn't be the infinite. So the logic of the infinite suggests it's got to be infinitely one. Not just one, but infinitely one. And being infinitely one, it has infinite diverse possibilities and that opens up individuality and diversity. All the languages come out of this. Every possible word, every item in the universe is coming out of that field. So that in the, in the, in the struggle of Abraham and Isaac at the founding of the Judaic religion, it was a struggle like Arjuna between do I put what my agenda is first or do I place God first, the infinite? Because God says one thing, love me with all your heart and mind and, soul, and strength. And what's here is so powerfully infinite, it, it, it is first. And being first, it has to be honored and recognized. That's all it is, that's the law. If you honor what's first and recognize it and treat it as first, you won't ego and put yourself first because the ego always privileges itself. So the Abraham-Isaac story is a great 
global story for all human beings. And Abraham, like Arjuna, had his agenda. He finally got his son, Isaac. And yet, just when he was so attached to Isaac, again, this attachment in, of, of, of what's here, the, the word said, sacrifice Isaac. Which is a horrible thought. And so the struggle of Abraham is, do I, do I listen to that word, or do I do what I want? And, and of course, the, the heroic struggle, and I, mean, I know we have many different interpretations of this, but, but the one, one storyline is that Abraham recognized he had to honor what's first above his own agenda. And at that moment, he broke the ego barrier. And in having broken the ego barrier and made the sacrifice, which all of these traditions say, that's what Krishna was teaching Arjuna, what's the secret of letting go of the ego? You gotta let it go, you gotta sacrifice it. But that's me, that's my ID, how can I do that? You gotta sacrifice it. Trust that when you let go of this, something tremendously greater will happen in opening up who you really are, right? How do you do that? Right? That's a terrifying kind of uh, prospect. But all the traditions had to face the question of sacrifice. And sacrifice doesn't mean a gory, bloody thing. Sacrifice is an act of recognizing and acknowledging what is higher as higher, and the willingness to let go of, of an attachment to ego identity, to your construct of yourself as not being you. It really is faith in yourself. And so forth. I can go on. I mean, basically, that you might say that Moses on the mountain talking to God, uh, the dialogue with Moses at the burning bush. All of Jesus' life might be seen as recognizing that you can't write the law in stone, you've got to live it in your heart. And everything he said was speaking this language. I am the way, the truth, and the life, things like that. Every miracle of transubstantiation, of taking things here and showing it's here. Taking water and making it into wine. Taking the blind and making it see. So all of these teachers are teaching technologies of being a human being. I mean, that's, and so when Jesus says, unless you die, you can't be born again. And the new covenant, all of that language, is really trying to open up this grammar that's been missing and that uh, East and West has been pointing to. So I'm going to accelerate now and bring the, the, this point back, back to, to where we are because uh, what I began to see as a philosopher and teacher, as I began to hear these voices of these great teachers, this is my God. I, even when I came back from India, I started teaching the Bhagavad Gita in the box. And I realized this can't be right. How can I be? I'm telling the students, I'm talking about Krishna, I'm talking about what is a dialogue. I'm trained to think in the box. We're all inveterately concerned with giving information in the box. But you can't download this script and this scripture and this language into the box. It violates it. You can't put God in the box. And so there's a deadly situation here, depending, are you using this technology or do you know this? Have you become literate in that? So what I began to see as I studied the different cultures and traditions is that while there is a, even though they're speaking differently, the Buddha is not saying the same thing, Krishna is not saying the same thing as Lao Tzu, is not saying the Yahweh, and Allah, and so forth. You know, there's a profound science and logic going on here. They're all speaking of the same fundamental logic and trying to show us that this one is problematic, to say the least. And so I began to have to reinvent teaching. After my first year of teaching Buddhist philosophy in the box and Hindu philosophy in the box, and I realized that's ridiculous because the whole point of the text is to get out of the box. So I had to help the students understand when you read the Bhagavad Gita, you're going to have to be willing to step back and listen to Krishna's voice speaking from here to Arjuna, or the Buddha's voice, or the voice of Jesus, or the voice of so many thinkers who were able to break out of the box. So what I began to do, and this is going to, this is really what I want to, to show, it became essential to mark when am I in the ego box? How do I, when I speak, how can I remind myself that I'm egoing, I'm ego speaking? And as a logician, I used a single bracket marker, I said, okay, let's, let's get a reminder. This is running out of ink, so I have to switch over here one moment, please. I hope you can see this. So I use single brackets, just single strokes, almost like a quotation mark, X, any word. When you mark it with single brackets, remember that's in the box. That's the language I'm using, that's the mind program. That's the technology. So if I say I, single bracket, I mean, I'm putting myself here. 
If I say pen, pen here. If I say you, I'm putting you here. Single brackets. Every word in our language, I can put in a single bracket and say I'm here. But how do I get this language? How do I know when I'm speaking the Buddha language or the Christ language or the Judaic language? And I use double brackets just as a marker to mark when you are using language in this space. This became crucial. Because once I separated this space from that and said, look, don't confuse these, that's a deadly move. And realize that there are two different dimensions of using our minds. And this is a hard language to, move, to use because this one keeps dividing and breaking up information and putting things in the box. And we don't realize, that's the point about the lens again, that there are many different separated pieces in this place. For example, you know, I talked about different lenses, but you don't have to just go across cultures and worlds around the planet to realize that you're living multiple worlds within yourself. Many of us, typical American people, are already living in multiple worlds. For example, I may be a believing Christian or a believing Jew, and I really take that seriously. I believe the Bible is it's true, it's the word of God, and God created the universe. But I may be a scientist, and I'm also a scientist, a physicist, and I realize that the physics is teaching, that if you're a good scientist, you realize that the evidence shows that there's a big bang that must have happened because the universe is expanding, and the only way to make sense is a big bang. Now that's already an ouch in my soul because I'm, I'm divided. Is it God who created the universe? Or is it the Big Bang natural event? And so I'm having trouble putting that together, but I'm also an American citizen. I really believe in the Constitution. And I believe in the, de the democracy and the separation of church and religion. So I want to keep God out of my politics. And even though my, my, my religion is saying, consider God in every breath you take all the time. You can't separate out from your life. But yet I want to keep my religion out. That's another ouch in the mind. Right, so not, not, there are three different lenses I've got right there. And in the political lens, uh, you know, I, I may be committed to choice and I really believe in freedom and choice and I'm pro-choice, pro but I also believe in my religion that life is sacred and I've got problems with abortion. So is it pro-choice, pro-life? What do I do? I'm getting really crazy and I'm going to see my psychiatrist at this point. <laughs> and she's a Jungian and she's telling me, you've got a male and a female cell. You've got an anima and the animas. And if you don't get your male and your female together, how can you be an educator? So now I'm really stressed out. So I'm flying over there to my friend who is a tree hugger, who really does yoga. So I'm now practicing yoga because I want to chill out and reduce the stress. So I'm chanting Om and doing prana, you know, and breathing and doing all the yoga to de-stress myself. Right? And then another friend tells me that you know you have to go to acupuncture in order to cure some of the illnesses you have because allopathic medicine is not working. <laughs> People die of medicine. Sorry, Bob. I <laughs> know. <laughs> and so you've got to be to really go to integral medicine and, and so forth. I've gotten into feng shui, and they say if you move your furniture around and all of that, your energy <laughs> you know, because you've got to get the chi working. And you see what I mean? We live in this space. And we don't realize that every one of those lenses are a different self, a different I. So the I that's a believing Christian, the I that's a scientist, the I that's a civic American, the I that's in therapy, the I that's a yoga practitioner, right, are different personalities, different ideas. And if you can't dialogue, and you can't bring them together and integrate themselves, you're a fractured person. You're like Arjuna on the battlefield. And it's very stressful if you're being your very being is fractured into multiple selves. You're multiple. It's a kind of schizo situation. And yet we don't know how to dialogue. How do you dialogue across worlds or worldviews? So the question of dialogue, what most of us call dialogue, is egologue. It's monologue, not dialogue. We don't know how to step back from our lens and enter the lens of the other genuinely. Right? If I'm a Christian, can I really enter into the world space of the Lakota? or the Dogon in Africa, or the, or, or the Chinese mind. We don't, we, we don't have literacy in that. And if you can't dialogue within yourself, okay, and there's no peace and integrity within yourself, how are you gonna dialogue with others in your own community, across the borders of your worldviews? And Lopez Allen, I'm sure, has different views uh, between people who may be conservative and who may be fundamentalist Christian, 
and those who are not, atheists and believers and so forth, can you have dialogue on Lopez? Is a question. You know, so the question about quantum Lopez, and I heard something sharp of, I immediately understood, uh, you know, I felt I understood what, what he was up to because uh, the quantum space, this is, this is really what I want to just focus on in the remainder of my reflections with you to stir some conversation. Uh, I, I'm trying to suggest that language in this integral space, so imagine what's going on here, however you call it, whether it's Tao or Allah, Yahweh, or nature, or energy, whatever, as a scientist, scientists also want what's to name the ultimate stuff. <coughs> Science is in quest of this field as well, and whatever name. And I saw that there was a logic, a science, a dynamic here that they all were tapping. So my life work has been to really decode or try to de build on these great teachers and decode the space, like the ultimate DNA to tap the missing grammar that's a matter of life and death. So I use the word logos. They did, we didn't even have a name for this space. I chose the Greek word because I'm a scientist and logician. And logos, from the Greek, is a very rich word. It means mind, it means word, it means speech, it means reason. It means all of the, you need a very rich word to be a candidate for this infinite word. So that in the beginning of the Gospel of John, when it says, the beginning is the Logos. So in the Christian sense, it took the Greek. In the beginning is a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word spoke, and that was reality. Let there be light. When this word speaks, things happen. Imagine, when the infinite word vibrates, whatever speaking is like up here, it's not like speaking here. When that word speaks, you've got a big bang on your hands. If I say, let there be light, I say, Sean Parv, please, the switch. <laughs> you've got to use the switch. <laughs> Speaking here is a totally different word. When, you, when this speaks here, right, it's a different kind of speech. So how do we speak? How do we enter into that space? This is called integral, holistic, non-dual. This means that the speaker and what you speak and what is spoken meet in one PowerPoint. In this speech, the thinker is over here. The thought that she has is here. She uses a particular language to describe a reality out there. So if I say the cat is on the mat, if I have a thought, I have a conscious thought. Consciousness is different from language, is different. The word is different from reality. So if I have a sentence, the cat is on the mat or the pen is black, well, that's going to be true if, in fact, out in the world out there, there is, in fact, a black pen or a pen exists. So language describes something outside, which is different from the language user. But when you go into a PowerPoint here, something incredible happens. By the way, that's what yoga philosophy was trying to show. When Krishna was teaching Arjuna, he said, let me teach you yoga, so that you can bring yourself into the own power. And to do that, you have to be so one with Om that when you say your name, you are that name, your utterance. You're not talking about something. That utterance is you. You become one with the utterance. So that when Moses, for example, was querying God at the burning bush, whom said, I say, sent me. And God, this word says, I am that I am. That's not a predication. When the infinite word, the infinite names, I am that I am. It's a different logic. When Jesus speaks this language, the, logo, lo, the Logos in the flesh, and says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, that's a different language than this one. Whereas I and the Father are one. That's standard. All of the teachers here knew that when you're connected, you are one with the ultimate in some profound sense. You're inseparable. So when you say, I and Brahman are one, or I and the Father are one, if you download it here, it's going to be hell. Because here in this logic, it says I equals God. And if you are God, and that's what you're saying, then we're going to have some problems. The language spoken here is typically downloaded here. Scripture, the word unfolding, is usually downloaded in this space and distorted and deformed. And the teachers are trying to teach us how to really enter into this and say, this is who we are. This is the language of connectivity and interconnectivity. 
So I'll give you one example. I'm going to wrap this up in a moment. Uh, I hope you get the idea. <clears throat> of, uh, because I think everything turns on this crossing. And when Descartes, the philosopher, performed his experiment of saying, is there anything that we're certain of? Let me see. He was doing Socrates' mission. And we, we misunderstood Descartes, I suggest, in a tragic way. He saw that every idea taught to him in every subject, and he had the best education of the day, every belief he had could be questioned and could be wrong. He said, I am awake now, but I could be dreaming. How do I know I'm not dreaming? A good point. Then he said, oh my God, mathematics, two plus two equals four. There, even in my dream, that's true. But then you realize, what if there's a demon deceiving me to make me think it's true when it's not? He had no answer for that. And in fact, there is a split between the thinker and the thought. There's an object that then refers to the world. So you're separating out constantly. So that Descartes, in effect, realized his mind, his body, his whole former story, all of his ID, he had to lay aside. He emptied the box. And when he did, he was very scared. He said, my God, what's going on? You know, who are, he, he, had, he had no ID left. And that's when he said, I am. But he said it here. He didn't have the tools yet. He didn't have the, he says, I mean, another dimension. He didn't say that. He, he seemed to be saying it here. But what he's saying is, I can't go back in the box. There's no certitude there. But what is clear is, I am. And then he immediately says in the meditation, I don't know what that means fully, but I know I'm in a new place. I never thought this before. I am thinking. Not I am thinking, but thinking am I. I it's, this language is so powerful that you can't separate the two pieces as separate. And thinking am I. He was not, and when he said I, he wasn't referring to some object outside. He was disclosing, he wasn't representing. He was presenting, he was performing the reality of announcing himself and pronouncing himself I am. He was out of the box. And he says, my God, we need to learn this language. Let me see what else I know. And he started to derive all of the information from the I am thinking. I am thinking. Existence, being is thinking. So he got that formula, being. Not being in the box. But being is thinking. Am I? So when you speak in the non-dual place, you can't separate out pieces of information. You integrate into one PowerPoint. And that's really the language of Indra's net. Every point encodes every other point. It's fractal. Scientists have a word for that now. The reality of the space, if this is nature, and nature is interconnectivity, then every point is touching every other point right now. And ego time, single bracket time, is not the same as double bracket time. If you could get this one point, you've got it. <coughs> ego time is broken. You have the past, the present, and the future. And they're all separate. And you could be obsessed with your past, you were abused, you had trauma, and you're stuck in the past, and you're predicating in the past, and that's itself, that's winning, and you can't get into the present. Or you're stuck in the future, I'm a student, I'm in a medical school, I'm really stressed out about my grades, what am I going to do, I'm gonna be... and you're stressing about the future. And then you make the mistake of thinking, I want to really, uh, you know, students do this on weekends, by the time they get a stick of fear, they want to be in the moment. So, so let's, you know, drink the beer and get, uh, you know, wasted and plastered in the moment. To, to be in the moment now, in this present, but that's not the now. The now is amazing. If you can enter the power moment, this is the whole point. Every moment, every point in this field being infinite is infinitely connected. We're one of those points. And when you can enter into the now, the present, what is it like? It's filled with every other moment. The past, the future, the present are fully connected right now. So all of global wisdom, the Hindus say, be here now. That sums it all up. All of Zen philosophy is the art and the practice of being in this moment, right now. Why? Because if you could be here, it's all taken care of. All of the future is here. If you're processing double bracket time, 
that in the sunshine of the summer is the storm of the winter and the snow, right now. If I put the pen here, well, this is a disposable pen. It's black, it's right. I give you the information about it. I'm going to perform a miracle now. Imagine the pen. It's totally different. It's filled with all the information of all culture. Imagine, for example, that the explorer going across the surface of Mars lifts this up. Imagine what they're saying in Houston. Houston, we've got a problem. <laughs> yeah. you know, because I mean, all culture, all history, all evolution is in this pen. It's laden with information. It expresses the entire universe. The whole history of humanity and culture and writing. This pen is mightier than that sword. That's a powerful pen. I feel so privileged to be holding this pen. <laughs> and you do this with every word. Every word needs to be rehabilitated. Imagine doing that with yourself. Who am I? Where each person encodes the entire evolution uniquely within her. And that's what all the teachers are saying. That's what the whole Judaic tradition, this Christian tradition, the Quakers are teaching. There's that of God in every person. Every person has a seed. All children, all of us talk with children of God, in the image of God, this is the image. So all of the teachers are teaching us, you've got to learn how to handle the power of this now. That's a, a Tola, e Eckhart Tola is writing the book, The Power of Now. He means this. And if you could enter into nature as, as a sacred space, imagine what nature is. Nature is not just nature, here. Nature is the embodiment of Logos, Brahman, Om, Yahweh. It is literally the body, embodiment. It can't be separated from the infinite. You can't break a piece of the infinite off. Every piece of the infinite is infinite. It's recursive. And it's scary to even think that we're boundless, boundlessly connected beings. So in a way, the whole story of, tech, of, of evolution, of culture, is learning how to cross from this space, which is adolescent and problematic. It's dysfunctional now that the planet is in trouble. And the problems across the planet, the crisis, this is what the World Wisdom Council I'm working with, with global teachers and global uh, wisdom, they all recognize that we've reached a crisis point on the planet that despite the great teachings of global wisdom that we've had for centuries and millennia, we still are stuck in the old technology of ego minding and not realizing we're continuing to fragment and fracture and divide ourselves, our relationships, and ourselves from the e ecology. And the cumulative effect of that over millennia is astounding. We've reached a crisis point and we see it everywhere we turn, whether you call it global warming, or, you know, or the greater disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And, uh, and all kinds of problems of fracture and breaking down of democracy and so forth. It has to do with this technology, ego mentalism, I call it. Ego mentalism, whatever you believe, you could believe in God, you could believe not in God, you could be a theist or an atheist here, you could be a Buddhist and a Hindu or a Muslim here, you could be a scientist here. We don't think of that, but a scientist can be an ego mental scientist which is almost a violation of what science is about. Science should be the, the capacity to revise and correct and not be fixated on a particular theoretical lens. So when you have the Newton lens, you see the world in a Newton way. If you morph that into an Einstein lens, you see an Einstein world. But it's very traumatic to shift the lens in science in a, in a revolution in science. And we're in the midst of a profound revolution in science now to get the lens to go to the unified field. And the unified field has a different technology of thinking. And that's where we're having trouble trying to download the unified field in the old, finitized, fragmented space. So culture is straining at every frontier to cross into the space. There's almost a deep groundswell, and the people know this. My students ask me when I'm teaching this, uh, you know, these texts of Buddha and Krishna and so forth, uh, and they begin to now open up these two dimensions. I introduce these two brackets and these two and they begin to practice it. 
Is it Professor Gangadi? That seems so hard for me. I mean, I understand this is right. This makes sense what you're saying. But if we're here, how can I get there? It seems so far away. And then I took something that took me years to do it. And if I turn this page, I may lose all of my pens. And this is awfully messy. So let's just start all over in a fresh space. I began to see that this picture of this down here and this up here is not quite right. It took me 10 years to do this, but then I saw this. <laughs> this is obvious. The infinite word, the logos, being infinite, surrounds all. And by the way, this is already also the space of the infinite, is what it's intended. You know? it's, just, it's not just logos, it's logos Sophia. Because you must say logos is the old male bond from It's logos Sophia, the infinite, the infinite word encodes every possible thing, every language, every culture, every iota in the universe is in the space of Logos. So it's a dynamic, open, boundless space of interconnectivity. And all the egoing we may do in this space is still within the Logos. We're never outside of it. It's an infinite force. It's always having its influence. It's moving all culture. Whatever the ego agenda, this is ruling. That's one of the axioms. As a simple one, how can you step outside and ch how can an ego challenge the infinite force? No matter, or even a culture. So the, the squeeze of the infinite force, this is the ultimate force of the universe, the logosphere. The logosphere is a space of nature, of logos, and all egoing, all cultures are situated in the logos. So I began to see a deeper law, which I call the law of relativity, that every X is X. Every X is X. Every X is X. Or written in another way, let's see if I do it up here. This is, I hope you can see that. I'll write it over again. Large. If you had to write your signature name now, you would do something like, here am I, that's my story. And I know that I'm one of those characters that uh, Gangadin spoke about because I spoke about because I know I'm a Christian and I know I'm American and I know I'm a, and I have all of these different lenses. But this is me. This is my story. Single bracket. And then you realize that you are already situated within the high space. You can't step outside of it. When you write your name, realize that it's always surrounded by the higher self, ever present. And that sums up all wisdom. All of the great teachers saw that the task of awakening as a human being is critically questioning the rigidity and ossification of the identity structures that we make, the stories we make of ourselves in predicating to just allow the higher self that is there to be. It's the most difficult journey and the most distant journey one can imagine to go from the self, ego, to the self from I to I. And that's the path of wisdom. And what they all say is, your self doesn't have to be realized, it's there, it's present. Your high self is real. The logos within you, the present is there. And whatever, however you construct yourself in your culture and make your stories and package yourself in the box, the you that is not in the box is ever present. Then the students begin to get it. Because I say, you know, there are many times in your life when this higher self Breaks, it's so powerful and ever present. The Logos is always working. So there are moments in all walks of life when this just drops for a moment and you have the joy of this. And I ask my students to start remembering. We think of a runner who's running. She's a Bryn Mawr runner, a woman running in the cross country. And the coach has been coaching her to run. How to run and how to lift and how to breathe, how to move her arms and her legs and, and, and move in certain ways. And she's been practicing running. Running. And three years later, in the summer, fall, in the fall, across the fields, she enters this blissful moment of running where she says, My God, where am I? She was just the running. That's the double bracket part. She was in the zone, as athletes say. It wasn't the ego running, it was just running. What's happening? The running, the movement, the person, the, 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 the body, the turf, was all one. It was integral. It was a high integral moment. 
What happened? Because she came back after that run and said, I'm so high. But now I'm back into the dorm and I have to go do my papers and so forth. And you come back into the old space. We know that feeling. So when you're on the soccer field, and you have the, those are moments when the high self spontaneously takes over. And these teachers were saying, that's you in a high moment. And we can, we're meant to be that. We're local beings. We're global citizens. Because when you enter into this high space, this is when you experience interconnectivity. I'm gonna wrap this up. I'm just giving you a sense of all of culture has been this deep, relentless push to birth ourselves into the human form. We're not ego beings, we're logos beings, we're dialogue beings. This is where dialogue happens, we're moral beings. You can't be a moral being in the ego because the ego is essentially a violent place because you objectify and split yourself off and your mind and your body and self and other is all broken into pieces. And you can't have love relationships in the single bracket. We raise our children in the single bracket space. We take them to school and school them in single bracket minding when they're spontaneously logos beings. Maria Montessori understood that about raising a sacred child. Right? And world of education is about the integral sacred child. So all of the move to integral education is an attempt, to, I think, to move into this integral technology of mind. So the sum, summation of all of this is that this long journey is that there is a profound event happening on the planet in the logosphere. And wherever the cultures may be in this space, you can't have real democracy here. Democracy is the deep dialogue. What is deep dialogue? when you're able to step out of your separate lens and dare to have the courage to meet the other in the space of I and thou. That's a dialogue space. When Martin Buber wrote his book, I and It, Ish and Du, I and Thou, you could read it here. That's how I read it as a graduate student. Later I realized, my God, he was saying that when you it the other and yourself, when it's an it, he was capturing the global wisdom. But I and thou, when you stand in the presence of an other and you don't put them through your lens and you open up the space to allow the other to speak her voice in her terms, that's how you honor the other. And that's what Buddha was seeing, that when you recognize yourself in the other and treat the other as yourself, then you're a moral being. That's the heart of ethics. So we've been really struggling here with dealing with yourself and treat the other as yourself. You know, the golden rule here in the hands of an ego can be a dangerous thing. Because egos can do dangerous things to themselves. And if they do them to the other, what they do to themselves, that may not be the best thing. But really here, when you recognize your being in the other, in the space of interconnectivity, Jesus saw this. So he said to his disciples, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. And the disciples listening in this old land said, why did we do that, Lord? When you tended the least of mine, you tended to me. That's a universal law. The I and the other are one in some profound sense, in their difference. That's the point I want to remember. This unity force is a strange logic in which identity and difference coexist in the PowerPoint of that moment. Every point in Indra's net, so to speak, is infinitely unique. Every person is a miracle absolutely unique, encoding the entire reality field, and yet infinitely connected at the same time. And that technology of having identity and difference, which has been at war here, culture has not been able to unite identity and difference, same and other, in this space. That's a whole other presentation, right? But just please, uh, just uh, I can develop that in the uh, dialogue period that's about to come up. But I could show quickly how culture has been in a war back and forth like a pendulum between stressing identity or stressing difference. Expressing the one or the other, the universal or the particular, the mind or the body, back and forth between the splits of polarity. And that we're now in a postmodern age. When I went to have it for 30, 39 years ago, we were still in the space of modernism, the, the early 60s and 70s. What is that? It's the view that there are universal truths for all worlds, uh, you know, right here in America. 
And then diversity hit the campuses and everything fell apart because of African American students saying, you know, you're not speaking my language. I'm a different, I'm in a different land. They didn't put it that way. And Asian students are in different, and Muslim students and, and so forth. And, the, and feminist thinkers were saying this patriarchal culture leaves no room for the feminist perspective. And everything began to fall apart and pulverize in this space into many different worlds and perspectives. And that's postmodern. Postmodernists can give up unity and go for difference. Because at least if you just honor difference, and you have your space and I have mine, and Lopez can be that way. It could be a place where we all have our fragmented little piece and we live with the difference. But let's not try for unity because unity is dangerous because who's unity? Is it going to be the Christian unity? Is it the atheist unity? The scientist unity? Who? We don't. Give up unity. And yet on the penny of the Americans, it says, e pluribus unum. Out of the many, one. One nation under God and all that talk. It can't be accomplished here in this logic of division and polarization. But crossing into this space is where you can find the PowerPoint of absolute unique individuality. Because what does individual mean? It means undivided. Individual means divided. Individual means not divided. To become individual, integral, whole, you've got to go into the integral technology. So that the path of the movement in America, and this is where Lopez, I'm coming now to Lopez, is that America, single bracket, is falling apart. The polarities in the culture, the lack of dialogue, is a very dangerous situation for democracy. Democracy, I would suggest, is predicated, the, the power to the people, is predicated on the people being we. And we, the we power of the people, in diversity, needs deep dialogue to pull off real democracy. Deep dialogue for deep democracy. And someone like Martin Luther King saw that because he saw that this America, single bracket, is not the same as the double bracket America. The place where there's brotherhood and, and love and unity and community and diversity and individuality. The Quakers are trying to get to that. Community and individuality. So when Martin Luther King in his had a dream, he says, I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the other side. I may not get there with you, but there's a time coming when the black man and the white man and the Gentile and the Jew are going to find that common ground. And that's America. So in a way, the American Revolution is about to happen. The first stage, taxation or, whatever, or no taxation, or well, the first stage, you know, the skirmishes have happened. But we still have the old lens. We brought that with us and still have it and cultivate it and raise our kids with it. And so the American Revolution, the real one, is to enter into this humane space of deep community in dialogue, respect for one another, real democracy, where we honor the individuality and diversity in the common ground. And that's what this technology will open up for us, unity in diversity in every point. So I feel that, um, thanks for your patience, I don't know how long I take, I sound out. Uh, maybe going on too long, I apologize if I went too long. But it's important not to have a conversation, and I would invite you all to share your questions. And then we're going to have a round table here in terms of Lopez, because here's what I feel. I think Lopez is powerfully poised precisely because it's a, a, an, an island in a community with locked in diversity, right? And you can go into your different compartments and tolerate one another. Or you can begin to model and be a laboratory for America and for the planet. And I really think that can happen here. And there are places around the planet, like Oroville, India, which is allegedly a city, a planetary city, attempting to embody the teaching of Aurobindo, the great global teacher. Right? They're trying to, to create a, a planetary city, a, a cosmopolitan diversity of many worlds, but they're falling apart. They're egoing. They're falling into the same cliques and factions and brokenness. And I've been there to remind them that this is Aurobindo. This is Indigo Yoga in that case, right? And I really feel that Lopez can be a shining example for, for America and for the planet. Uh, if, if we could pull off the miracle of real dialogue here, real dialogue, of honoring one another in our diversity and realizing that diversity is sacred and that unity is not a threat to real diversity. And that's deep dialogue. So I'm hoping we can really model that 
and, uh, and I know that uh, Sean Park, that what you've been doing here, Quantum Lopez, to me that's this, this is Quantum Lopez. Because what is quantum? Quantum language is the attempt to develop a new language of physics that recognizes you can't separate consciousness from nature. And if you've seen the movie What the Bleep is a popular movie, What the Bleep is simply saying one message. You are as you mind, you're not a victim of your world. You may feel like a victim of your world in your story, but you have a powerful choice. Consciousness can shift the whole lens. That one lesson is an incredibly empowering lesson. Right? in terms of quantum reality and the interconnectedness. So now science is finally developing the tools to handle this of non-locality. What does that mean? That means even the Einstein lens ain't working no more. That there, the velocities, are, events can take place at distant parts of the universe simultaneously, which defies the law that the ultimate velocity is the speed of light. Non-locality, the butterfly effect, what is that? That's causation, double brackets. Not linear cause, single bracket. This cause causes that, this cause, you know, that's linear, that's not holistic thinking. The holistic technology, imagine, everything is interconnected causally. And if we're going to be scientists and understand causation, and the headache I'm having, or whatever it may be, there are all kinds of systemic causes. That's integral medicine, bringing the many different levels together in understanding the higher anatomy of the human being, not just in the box. Our bodies are not just in the box. Imagine if I could experience my body. What would my body be like out of the box? It's an out-of-body experience. <laughs> and if I can experience my mind, the awakened mind, I'm out of my mind. <laughs> right? So the two languages, you know, we have to really become... Learning. So, Shambhav, thank you very much, and let's have some conversation now.